Um, I will just apologise in advance for those who don't know me. I'm Stephen Dowd, I'm chair of the All Party Group on uh, Trevian Aids. Um, but I need to go into the Chamber of the House Commons in about uh, 30 minutes or so. So I'll be with you for the first part. And then uh, Mark uh, from our Secretariat will uh, ably take over, chair it, and uh, doing the QA section. Um, but we've got four fantastic uh, panellists with us today. Let me just uh, bring up their uh, details. We have uh, Dr. Michael Brady joining us. Um, who many of you will know Dr. Michael Brady. He's a sexual health and HIV consultant at King's and also the first national advisor for LGBT health. And he's also medical director at Terence Higgins Trust. We've got uh, Dr. Valerie Delpesh, um, who is a medical epidemiologist based at PHE, um, who leads a team of scientists and data managers to monitor uh, the epidemic and the quality of care people are receiving throughout the UK. Um, we've got Dr. David Chadwick, who is an infectious diseases specialist at James Cook University Hospital in Middlesbrough. And we've also got Dr. Elizabeth Gahika, um, who is the programs manager for Alice Medical Service in Uganda. Um, so fantastic um, panel. And um, just really for myself, just to, to kick off today, uh, before we move straight on to our panellists to hear from them, um, I, I think late diagnosis is one of the biggest challenges that we face, particularly in the UK. We've seen incredible progress, um, but also um, huge challenges now with some particular issues. Obviously, we've been talking a lot about testing recently. Testing, of course, crucial to avoiding late diagnosis. And one of the most powerful events, certainly as chair that I hosted um, in the last few years in Parliament, was where we had a, uh, a woman, I believe in her sort of mid-50s, um, who uh, disclosed her HIV status to us um, and had been late diagnosed in her life and went through a very sort of personal and challenging um, uh, testimony of her own experiences um, and, and what that meant for her, both medically and uh, in terms of mental health. Um, and of course, late diagnosis increases the risk of um, both ill health, early death and onward transmission. So it's absolutely crucial that we are identifying um, HIV cases in the UK absolutely crucial as early as possible, getting people into treatment and allowing people to live those full, happy and healthy lives that we know that people living with HIV can now live thanks to the incredible advances that we've seen in uh, the last few decades in terms of treatment. So um, without further ado, um, uh, I think we've got lots of people to join now, lots of colleagues from across uh, both houses and from a range of partner organisations. Um, but uh, Mark, unless, unless um, there's another order, um, I think I'm going to go to uh, Michael first. So Michael, if you're with us, I'd like to hand over to you. We're going to have a short presentation from each of our panellists and then we'll move mm -hmm. over to uh, question and answer and discussion. Michael. Uh, thank you, Stephen. Just a few brief thoughts. Uh, thanks for the invitation. Um, uh, reflecting on, uh, you're absolutely right, the real challenges of late diagnosis, there's probably three or four key things uh, around the HIV epidemic that we um, have to ramp up our um, efforts to address late diagnosis uh, being uh, one of them. Um, it's interesting reflecting on the, I can't remember, the 20 years that I've been working in HIV, the proportion of late diagnosis has remained, of those diagnosed late, has remained um, stubbornly at around about 40%, although the numbers uh, like diagnoses are going down. So it's a reflection of the fact that whilst we are making progress, we've still got uh, a lot more to do. We've always traditionally, um, and still, uh, labelled late, di late diagnosis based on a CD4 count or an individual's level of immune damage when they're diagnosed, whether that's 350 or very light uh, diagnosis at 200. But I think as part of shifting our paradigm and shifting the approach to addressing late diagnosis, we should remember that we, we, we recommend HIV treatment at any stage of infection, and there are benefits uh, of therapy uh, uh, when you start therapy at any CD4 count, even a high CD4 count. So in a way, all of those who are undiagnosed, all 6,000, are effectively late diagnoses, um, uh, and those who are diagnosed at the later stage are those for whom it impacts uh, the greatest. Um, I don't want to steal anyone else's thunder. I think we were going to move through various topics on this. So uh, Mark, do you want me to keep going or to, to hand over to one of the other speakers, Stephen, or Mark. I can keep going, but I don't want to steal at the other excellent people. <laughs> well, well, Michael, why don't, we, why don't we move on to the panellists and then perhaps bring you back in at the end, um, if you've got any further comments first before we move out to um, the Q&A, but obviously, real pleasure to have you with us today. But um, um, I think um, the next on the list is from uh, Valerie. So, uh, Dr. Valerie Delpesh, um, if you're with us, um, the floor is yours. Thank you very much and good afternoon. I hope you can hear me all very clearly. Um, <clears throat> I think, you know, your introduction is, is spot on. 
we have made huge inroads in improving the lives of people living with HIV, in diagnosing individuals, particularly those most at risk. And if we think about gay men and, and the reductions in transmission and new diagnoses of particularly gay men who are more connected to um, services such as GUM services and, and um, generally are aware of, of HIV, um, it's been phenomenal and we're, we're world leaders and you know we need to just sort of take stock. We're not quite there yet, so it's not the end. We're, we're, but we're on track to eliminate HIV transmission potentially by the UNAIDS goals of 2030. So with that backdrop, there are individuals who are not being reached by our various um, prevention efforts or, or do not identify as being at risk or are not regular attending at GUM clinics if they're a gay man, for instance. And so there are some really clear challenges. And even though the numbers are um, dropping, it does mean um, it, it's even more challenging because when we look at the uh, distribution, if you like, of people living with, with uh, people who are diagnosed late living with HIV, um, they are from all sorts of um, geographies. They're spread right across in terms of sexuality, in terms of ethnicity. So what really you're, you're actually trying to grasp are probably individuals who do not connect with, with being at risk and, and certainly are not, not going to be reached by our traditional prevention efforts. And this is why HIV testing modalities and uh, allowing as much possibilities of testing other at home, through clinics, through the internet, et cetera, are extremely important uh, uh, strategies, which we are developing and, and need to, to continue. So that's one point I wanted to make. The other thing is when people are diagnosed late, we know the cost on the individual can be tremendously uh, um, immense. Um, they are at high risk of death within a year of diagnosis, eight times higher than those diagnosed promptly. Um, they are also those individuals who are more likely to be hospitalised and, and, um, and take a long time to recover. So the personal cost is huge and so is the um, economic cost. But they are also the individuals who are more likely not to know about their HIV status and therefore more likely to pass on their, their virus. And, and as Michael said, they're part of that undiagnosed large, um, potentially 6,000 people each year that still remain undiagnosed and I'm not aware, therefore, that they may be at risk of passing on um, HIV. And it is such a pity to, because essentially we know now, once you are treated for the benefit of your own health, you're also completely um, unable to pass on virus to other individuals. And so this U equals U, untransmissible uh, message is really, really key to making people also who are probably fearing getting diagnosed, understanding that when they are undiagnosed, not only are they better for their health, but they're also much more likely to, to feel, um, uh, you know, to, to be reassured that um, they can't transmit uh, virus. And I think the you equals you message is one of the key messages, I think, in the last few years that um, we know is, is really taking some ground within the community of people and the, and the HIV sector, but probably not well known more broadly and that's that could be um, one of the key messages uh, to come out of this particular discussion. I'll leave it there because I think there's other speakers um, as well. Thank you. Thanks so much. Really, really, uh, really helpful um, presentation there. And we'll move on to um, Dr. Chadwick now uh, from Middlesbrough, if you're with us. Yes, I am. So, um, fantastic. Thank you, thank you for um, the invitation. And I, I, there really isn't a lot I can add to what um, Michael and Valerie have already said. I think um, the only other thing I was going to say is, is uh, following on from Valerie's comment about the difficulty as we go towards this 2030 target of um, finding those hard to reach people is that we do know that you know, there's still quite a few people coming in um, who are, who are um, coming into various NHS services, GP practices, hospitals, um, who are still not being tested and we're finding out years down the line that they should have been tested. And I think that's an area where we can try and work harder to promote that sort of testing in NHS services. 
Um, and there's all sorts of reasons behind that, and we can go into, into that later. But I'll, I'll just add that that's probably the other area we really need to concentrate on. Fantastic. Well, we'll, we'll just we'll head over now for for a, for an international uh, perspective now. Um, and uh, if uh, we have Uganda on the line, I hope we have um, Dr. Kihiko with us. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Good uh, afternoon and good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Elizabeth Kihika. I am indeed the programs manager at Alive Medical Services, uh, found in uh, Uganda, uh, Namongo, Kampala, Uganda. Uh, this is a charity organization that uh, has been working with um, HIV, caring for HIV clients for over 14 years now, and we have over 13,000 um, clients under our care. So we have a lot of experience in, uh, in receiving clients who are actually presenting in the late stages. And I do agree with all the previous pre presenters that indeed um, late diagnosis is um, one of the deterrents to us achieving our, uh, our targets when it comes to HIV um, epidemic control, AIDS epidemic control. We know that even in um, sub-Saharan Africa, uh, it's over 30 to 40% of uh, the newly diagnosed uh, actually present late uh, as per the definition uh, one of my colleagues mentioned, where we find either they will present with an AIDS-defining event, or else um, they would definitely present with a very low CD4 count. This, um, as Valerie hinted, um, definitely deters our efforts of prevention when it comes to you, is equal to you, undetectable, is equal to untransmissible, because the higher, the, 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 the later the person presents, means the higher the viral load, and that means the higher the risk of transmission. And that definitely has an effect uh, on, on our um, the way we are able to reduce on the number of infections. But also it has an implication in terms of cost, because um, most cases the person will present with um, opportunistic infections that will have uh, an, implica an implication in terms of human resource for health, in terms of uh, medication, uh, in terms of uh, days admitted on the on the ward. So it has both uh, direct and indirect implications, even for the patient themselves. So finding a strategy of reducing on the number who present late is something we should really um, join efforts and make sure that we're in position to work on this. I'm happy to mention that also on, on the call, I've seen my directors of Alive Medical Services, and I'm also happy to mention that um, we are having a strong partnership with um, Frontline AIDS uh, in uh, Brighton. They have really been instrumental in, in our fight against HIV AIDS as well as sexual reproductive health. Thank you very much. Over to you, Stephen. Thanks very much. Well, uh, we've had some um, great uh, food for thought to start us off in the, in the, in the conversation. Um, I wondered, to, uh, Michael, if you wanted to come back in and just reflect on everything that's been said so far, and then I've got a couple of questions for, for the panellists, and then we'll, we'll open it to the, uh, to the room. But, um, Michael, is there anything particularly you wanted to add? I think there's a, there's, there's a couple of other things that we could we could explore in more detail. You can't have conversations like this without uh, addressing or mentioning stigma. Um, it, it's probably the single biggest thing that we need to... Um, overcome in every aspect of uh, beating the HIV epidemic. You know, it's stigma, myths, and misunderstandings around HIV that prevent people from testing, that prevent those who are diagnosed sometimes from engaging fully uh, in um, in treatment uh, services. So, any strategy to address um, uh, late diagnosis and undiagnosed HIV has to have stigma and addressing stigma at its heart. I think we've still got a lot to do to really understand all of the components of stigma. It's often a very individualized thing and therefore our approaches often need to be um, individualized uh, for those communities who are most affected or um, yeah, by late diagnosis. So I think stigma needs to be um, underpinning this. I think uh, the point about um, U equals U, undetectable equals uh, um, untransmittable is really key to this for a number of reasons and it's good that that's been highlighted already um i think in itself the u equals u message is something that we need to be spreading much more widely and much more deeply into these communities because it often is a way of addressing stigma or certainly a way to encourage testing we now have two really strong incredible messages around hiv 
all driven by the effective therapies that we have now, that if you're diagnosed early, you can expect a long and normal healthy life. And if you're on effective treatment, you can be confident there's a zero risk of transmission. And augmenting those messages is part of the toolbox, if you like, of encouraging uh, people to test. But pinning it down is um, phrase from the HIV Commission, test, test, test. I mean, that really has to be the answer. Um, we have much to celebrate, as Valerie said, in the UK. Our testing strategies have been incredibly uh, effective. Uh, we have exceeded the 1990-90 UNAIDS target. I think we have a real chance of achieving ending transmissions by 2030 uh, and soon ex exceeding 95, 95, 95. But at the root of that has to be testing. So we need a better understanding of what's worked so far. and We've got really great examples of that and what the real barriers are and how to overcome those using they're not even really novel testing technologies anymore, but using strategies like self-sampling and self-testing, taking testing to the communities who we know are at greatest risk but are the least likely to come to services, considering con con continuing that shift of testing out of sexual health services and into other areas um, where we know that people who are living with undiagnosed um, HIV are attending. The model that's often quoted is the maternity, model um, which has been incredibly successful for, for 15 years or so now, a pure opt-out, uh, simple opt-out HIV testing approach. Uh, that means that pretty much every uh, pregnant woman in the UK gets tested for HIV and we've pretty much uh, nearly eradicated mother-to-child transmission as a result of that. We've seen increasing success of some opt-out models in certain settings. Um, some people on the call may well have been at the Beaver Bash conference or the Croy International Conference recently that saw some great work from Croydon that have got a sustained 97% uh, testing rate in their accident and emergency department. You can see other good examples around the country, other examples in primary care, but we're not systematizing that enough. And I think we need to go beyond the good work of the very committed individuals in those areas and think of other levers like incentivizing or contractual levers to get a purely opt-out model in those areas like primary care in Amy, because the people who are living with undiagnosed HIV are not going to come to my sexual health service, but they will pass through their GP and, uh, and their a &E, uh, department. So yeah, that was my other just or extra thoughts, I suppose. No, great, Mark. And I was going to mention uh, stigma um, in particular, I think, is one of the huge issues that we still see, obviously, affecting uh, the situation both here in the UK and globally. And it's one of the biggest barriers that we have to overcome. And I think we've got to make sure it's at the heart of everything that we we all do as, as campaigners and, and, and activists on the issue. Um, I wanted to ask a question, really, to, to all panellists. Um, I mean, what, one of the pieces of work that we've done as an all-party group um, over the past few years was looking particularly at marginalised um, groups um, and, and those who are sometimes the hard, hardest to reach. And that's become particularly more important in the UK as we've seen infection rates come down. And we're trying to get to those last groups of people who... Um, are undiagnosed, but but how, what do you think are the most effective strategies for it? For example, when um, dealing with whether it's uh, particular um, particular ethnic or religious communities, or um, uh, injecting drug users, or sex workers, or uh, the trans community. We had an excellent uh, panel uh, event uh, the other day on trans and non-binary issues. Um, what, what, do, do we need a, just a very nuanced strategy from city to city, location to location, country to country, or are there kind of lessons that can be learnt um, across the piece? I don't know who would like to have a go at answering that first. Hi, it's Valerie. I'm happy to... Hi, Valerie. Um, hi there. Just, um, again, emphasising, totally agree with the, the issue of stigma in particular and, and the layers of stigma because obviously we're touching on race, we're touching on sexuality and, um, you know, injecting drug use, all of those are, are added layers for individuals. And, and we know from the Positive Voices survey that we ran a few years ago in particular that um, this leads to a, a lot of non-disclosure. So, you know, you're likely to present late but also not tell a soul about your HIV. And that leads to mental health issues. And, and then you might be in a partnership where you're not sharing your status, et cetera. So it is all very tied in. And stigma is a major, major uh, area that we need to address much better in the UK, particularly that we've committed again to, to reaching zero stigma, whatever that means. But certainly it is about addressing those layers of, of stigma. And then it touches on your question, Stephen, around uh, communities. How do we reach? Um, 
I think there isn't one. I think, you know, we, we, when we wanted to establish the big models of what works in terms of a testing strategies, and we've looked at the randomized control trials, and yes, we know we touch. I think we're beyond that when we get to an epidemic now that is much more nuanced and the local issues and applying local knowledge. Um, so applying the science, but really being contextualized about how that works for uh, given different communities in different settings and really engaging those communities to, you know, asking the questions locally of what can work. And, and it's a bit about that implementation science philosophy where it's not just about putting the program in and saying, okay, great, let's look at the answer two or three years, did it work? But it's a continuous process. As we're starting to, you know, really see how, what, what's working in my emergency department, what do I need to tweak to make that better? What outreach do I need to do? Why are there individuals for which um, self-testing is very favorable, but not for others. It's a continuous question of refining that. And certainly I think, um, you know, we, we can learn a lot by collecting the right monitoring data and engaging communities in those conversations. Elizabeth, I wondered if you would maybe able to say sort of who are the hardest re to reach groups in, in Uganda and what are some of the strategies that you and others are, are doing to reach them? Yes, oh, thank you very much, um, Stephen. Um, I'll say indeed um, the vulnerable and marginalized populations are uh, the populations that call us to actually look for innovative ways outside of the box to in indeed reach them. And um, as our live medical services, uh, we have been privileged to uh, be involved in a number of uh, um, projects that involve uh, involve really reaching out to the uh, marginalized uh, populations, especially the sex workers and MSMs, LGBTI groups. And some of the strategies we've really seen that have worked in our scenarios are, uh, for example, the, the, uh, the APN, Assisted Partner Notification, where we use the index client to make sure that we reach to their sexual network. And uh, we've seen that really um, enable us to reach a number of, uh, of people in this population, as well as the social network strategy. It has worked very well for us because they are kind of a closed community given the environment in Uganda. Um, they are not so out and that adds on the, their vulnerability and marginalization. So penetrating the community requires quite a number of innovative ways. Then uh, oftentimes we've conducted mobile um, <clears throat> outreaches, moonlight <clears throat> clinics, where we're in position to meet them in the bars, we're in position to meet them in areas they're most comfortable to be to receive the testing, uh, uh, testing services. And in those instances, we go fully equipped with integrated services, we hold the full um, set of um, health workers ready to test, ready to treat, ready to, to, to carry out investigative procedures as well. Then we've also used a strategy of um, uh, peer educators where we've identified um, key people in, let's say, in the those sex workers, uh, would be in the MSMs, who are vocal and who are in, pos in position to reach out to their uh, to their colleagues. And these have used the self-testing modality such that they are able to have the self-testing done in the community and then they are able to be in, in position to refer them for further treatment at, um, at a live. So we have been employing a number of them as well as home-based testing where a team uh, gets to the community and does um, door to door um, um, uh, testing so that those who are remaining are in position to receive the services. Thank you. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, that's really helpful to hear some of those practical solutions. I mean, particularly what you're talking about peer educators and people in different groups and, and communities who are able to, to share the message and to ensure that people are able to access services. Absolutely critical. And, um, you know, I'd, I'd praise the work as well in, in the UK. We, we have um, an initiative, and it's global initiative, but Fast Track Cities. And so in my own city in Cardiff, and I can spot some of the uh, participants on the uh, on the call today, uh, we, we're doing a lot of work to help um, ensure that people can access testing and we are driving down um, new infections, particularly in, in, in some communities that are the hardest to reach. So um, great to hear the perspective from Uganda as well. Um, I apologise that I have to um, go into House Commons right now because we have a statement on international development and funding for official development assistance, which of course is very crucial to um, uh, the HIV AIDS um, debate and the UK's support globally. Um, but Mark um, from Secretary is going to take over chairing and we're going to open it to questions from the floor now. 
to take. Um, if you'd like to ask a question, pop your hand up or pop something in the chat. And Mark, over to you. Uh, thank you, Stephen. Um, I've just got one question for the, the panel. Um, what is the impact of late diagnosis on the person and the health services in general? And so that people can actually know what that impact is. So, uh, David, do you want to start off on that one? Yeah, sure. So, we, as Valerie's already said, you know, if, if you're diagnosed late, um, you have something between sort of eight and ten times higher risk of uh, dying of HIV or AIDS. Um, and it's, you know, not, not in terms of other problems, you know, there's pe people diagnosed late have often have chronic opportunistic infections, sometimes cancers or tumours. And that all, all leads to a really important, uh, what we call morbidity problem, which is people feeling unwell. And it's likely that, you know, a lot of people have ill health for many years afterwards, precisely because they were diagnosed late rather than, and they wouldn't have had these problems if they'd been diagnosed five or ten years earlier. Um, and we also know that it, it, uh, it, it has an impact on your ability to uh, respond to treatment. So the antiretroviral therapies, although they work you know, incredibly well in most people, you're at slightly reduced risk of having a good response to antiretrovirals with um, if you do present, present late. Um, so that's, I think, the, the key ones I, could, I would say. Uh, does anyone else want to come into us? Elizabeth, Michael? Um, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't mind adding a few. I mean, I, I always think it's important. Uh, I mean, David, David's really um, uh, put, the, put those kind of like the risks of uh, illness and risks of death thing very clearly, but it's important to really drive home, particularly that mortality data. That's an eight to ten times increased risk of death in the first year. It's not death ever. It's a very short term, short term mortality as well as the, the illnesses that go, go, go with it. And we've I mean, we've all, probably all been talking about the problems of late diagnosis for for a, for a long time, and it's essentially a, any measure that you look at is worse if you were diagnosed late. You know, you're going to be more likely to get ill. You're going to be more likely to die. You certainly will have spent more time with a detectable viral load, and therefore uh, uh, with risks of transmission to 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 others. And and it, even if none of those individual things matter to you or us or a society, one thing that does matter uh, certainly when thinking strategically about the health service is the cost and the cost of, of a late diagnosis is considerably higher. The numbers shift a little bit as our cost of treatment shifts and depending obviously on what setting, whether that's a resource poor or, or, or setting or, or, or not, but it is much more expensive in both non-HIV and HIV healthcare to look after somebody who's diagnosed late than it is to look after somebody who's diagnosed early, particularly when an HIV test can be as little as uh, four or five pounds. So that investment in the test uh, saves a considerable amount of money even before you get to the individual impacts. I think also as well as those kind of broad um, statistics, I, I think that there is a challenge also on the individual level, this is just my own perspective from, from clinic, of finding it often harder or taking longer to come to terms with your diagnoses. I mean, you, you've got the background already probably of, of living with a lot of stigma, perhaps living with myths and misunderstandings, living in a difficult or harder situation for, for, to be out about your HIV. But when, when you're diagnosed late, usually perhaps as an inpatient, perhaps with a number of medical or severe HIV related diseases, you don't have as much time to come to terms with your diagnosis, to think about disclosure, to really absorb all of the life-changing information that we're trying to give. So I think the coming to terms with and dealing with and the support that's required is greater because you're landing an HIV diagnosis in the context of, of often quite complex uh, illnesses uh, in, a, in a late diagnosis, which feeds into those mental health problems, which are greater, as, as Valerie's points out. Elizabeth, Valerie? Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Just in addition to what um, David and Michael have mentioned, the uh, late diagnosis, um, the person will, in most cases, will have um, an impaired quality of life because they are indeed sickly and um, they'll spend most of the time probably they may be admitted or, and in the process you find that it will affect them economically, not just what they are spending, but in some cases you'd find um, they would uh, 
uh, they will not be in position to earn uh, for themselves and for their family. So we find that it becomes a vicious cycle. We've seen um, in our setting, in most cases, um, this translates to poor nutrition as well. And this further causes a, a, down, a downhill trend for the person. Um, also, it also um, bring, comes with um, mental health problems, especially depression, as uh, Michael Ebley put it, coming to terms with the diagnosis, find that one, they are not only ill, they are trying to deal with conditions that are now really um, very visible. Uh, uh, and in the process, they are struggling with the stigma and uh, internal stigma and discrimination and end up getting into depression. So you find that it, 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 it affects the person both individually as well as the society where they come from, as well as the health system, because you find you will devote more resources to caring for this person and you end up having a, um, an increased cost in the end. Thank you. Valerie, did you want to come in or? No, I think it's been well covered. Uh, I, I guess the, the, the only other issue to add is, is the issue of transmissibility. Obviously, if you're not aware of your own diagnosis, you're also um, more likely to pass this on virus to your partners. And, and certainly that is one big of a piece of the puzzle in, in reaching HIV elimination um, of transmission if, if, if we're going to get there. So there's, a, a, you know, many different personal economic system and and also public health reasons and i guess in a time of COVID, we can reflect um very differently about infectious diseases a lot of people now understand a whole range of um, issues around transmissibility and and etc and unlike COVID, hiv is not very infectious um and particularly once people are on treatment they're completely uninfectious i mean it is an absolute miracle if you like and so to, to get that message across again, as I'm saying from before, um, is, is a huge benefit to transmission, but to people who feel, as Elizabeth has highlighted, um, often a huge mental health and burden and guilt as to why you know, they might have presented late and maybe passed on to partners. And had they known that, um, the, the, you know, the, the revelation of hearing about you equals you has been, has been phenomenal for people and, and how it's, it's, it's changed that. And, modalities of testing and are able to, to test earlier from, from their own home and, or pressing a, an app, again, revolutionary. And, and we need to really, really capitalize on those learnings over the last few years. Uh, thank you, panelists. Um, I see without even asking uh, if there's any questions, I've already got three. I'll go to um, our uh, vice chair, uh, Holly Mumby Croft first, and then I'll go to uh, Kerry and then Steve. Holly, over to you. Thank you, Mark. And my apologies, I was a few minutes uh, late joining today due to, due to a, a previous meeting. Um, what Valerie just said around our increased understanding of viruses over this last year was incredibly interesting and, and insightful. Thank you for that. Um, I just wanted to ask, and apologies if this has been covered earlier on, who is most vulnerable to a late HIV diagnosis and, and what are the reasons for that, whether it's awareness or accessibility of tests or stigma or, or all of those reasons, who typically would be most vulnerable to a, a late diagnosis? Can I? Oh God, <laughs> you go on, I was going to share, a, share this, a, a slide which gives actually your, all your information, Valerie, so you, you might want to, <laughs> um, let's see if we can get it on the screen. Can, can you see the screen? Can you see the, the, the late age diagnosis um, screen with the different coloured bar charts? Yeah, we can see that. Yeah. Oh, great. So, I mean, basically that, that, that sums up, you know, it's, it's a few years out of date, but it's probably not changed a great deal. But the people are most at risk, um, if you go from left to right, are um, females, older people. Um, in this one, it's uh, black and other ethnicities. Uh, but interestingly, it's heterosexual women and uh, IV drug users particularly. Um, and some of the work that we've we've done more recently has you know has suggested that sometimes sort of particular groups like white heterosexual women, particularly middle aged women, are at increased risk because essentially healthcare workers don't seem to see them as a um, as having a high risk of uh, HIV. So it is um, um, it is um, 
quite easy, you know, there is the data there to show what those what high risk groups are, and that's a useful start in terms of where you can try and target some of your resources. Valerie, did you want to come in on that one? Um, no, uh, David has covered it. I, I, if, if you look at the 20, I'll put some data, you know, if people wanted to. Yeah. Um, for the 2019 data, uh, they represent about 40%, as we say, 42%. But actually, there's a caveat to the new diagnoses now. We've, tried, we've started to separate people who are newly diagnosed in the UK um, who are diagnosed for the very first time versus those who actually were diagnosed in another country beforehand for whatever reason. And if you take those away, then actually the late diagnosis rate goes from 42 up to 49%. Um, because the ones that have come before are actually not likely to be late. They may have been on treatment beforehand and et cetera, et cetera. So we're looking at a totality of about 1,500 people in 2019 who were diagnosed late. And, they, and, they, and there is, as David said, they're more likely to, that proportion is, is higher among older age groups with the caveat that people who are diagnosed later are likely to have a more severe decline of their CD4 count, which we mustn't forget. But that doesn't mean, it, it means late is even later, if you like, because you, you've actually got shorter time to before you actually, uh, your immune system is, is um, may, may be damaged. So they're, they're more likely to, actually two thirds of them are, are actually gay men. So that's another thing to, to think through. It's, it's, and these are the gay men who don't identify often. Um, half of those are, are going to be gay men who've never been to a sexual health clinic. Um, and um, the, the, about half are, are, are of white ethnicity and the other half are very mixed. Um, so black Africans, although the, the rate is high among that group, they, the totality of that group is only about a quarter of all people diagnosed late are actually uh, from African communities. But what we find is it's really, really diverse. And um, when we'll be starting some uh, in-depth interviews this year of people diagnosed late specifically, and we've been working with a, a few other colleagues um, following up people who diagnosed late to ensure that they've had opportunities in the system to be seen and, and, and um, op early opportunities for testing as, as um, David's already raised, but also talking to the individuals to find out, was it about stigma? Uh, what is it that held them back from testing? And, and often it is people who actually did not identify as being at risk of HIV. Um, so it is back to that message of opportunity for testing as often as possible, even if you don't think you're at risk, healthcare workers feeling very comfortable to do opt-out testing. So HIV indicator conditions is a classic one, but also just that um, that side of thinking, actually, uh, I've never had a HIV test. I probably should have one, you know. Um, and with the caveat that this isn't such a, a horrible diagnosis, in fact, nowadays, you live, you know, a much, uh, a, a completely full life um, on treatment provided, you know, that you're, you're only, disadvantage with HIV compared to many chronic diseases is when you're diagnosed late. So you really want to get diagnosed early. I mean, obviously you want to avoid having infectious disease if you can, but HIV is one of those where actually nowadays um, it is treated much, much better than many other chronic diseases. Yes, um, is that right, Tim? Yes. Yeah, uh, now concerning that, um, who is most um, likely to present late? Interestingly, now current setting, uh, especially in Uganda, uh, we've noticed that it's the men who are more likely to present late than the women. Uh, actually, the latest um, uh, study showed that uh, whereas the overall, overall um, prevalence was about uh, 9%, about 11% were, uh, uh, you have more men coming in late uh, with a late uh, diagnosis for HIV as opposed to women, because most cases women have more opportunities to get services and to be tested. Then the other group was of course, um, those who perceive to be having a low risk. And you find that in most cases that the young people and the youth who seem to think that uh, they, are, they are at low risk. And instead, when we get to test, we find that they're actually at a higher risk. 
then uh, of course those who are experiencing a lot of stigma and discrimination that is um, in the key population they are not able to access services easily so you find that in most cases they they they, they present late and uh, most people, uh, those who present late, when you dig deep, you ask, why hadn't you tested? Like, I was not sick, so there was no need for me to, uh, to go for a, a test. So in the end, they end up coming in late. Then we also have seen barriers where um, those who live far from a health facility as one of the challenges um, uh, to accessing the testing services, those who live more than five kilometers from my health facility, or are unemployed and think they have they have to pay a particular cost to be tested. These are the ones we are seeing that are still coming in late. And uh, in our setting, we've also seen a number who have sought medical care, non-medical care elsewhere. For example, they go to, uh, whenever they're ill, they go to pharmacies to get off the counter medication. These tend to present late. Or, or those who have uh, resorted to traditional healers, they also tend to present late in our setting. So there are multifactorial reasons and um, uh, that you find a number of people as to why a number of people do come to present late. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, Michael, I don't know if you want to come in on this or do you think everything's been said? Uh, no, I don't think anything else to add to that. Thanks. Uh, Holly, did you want to come back on anything that um, the panelists said or? Just just thank you for, for taking the time to, to explain that to me. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, Kerry, uh, it's over to you. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, just to introduce myself, I'm Kerry Hood. I work at Cardiff University and I'm the representative on Fast Track Cardiff of the university. Um, but I wanted to come back. You've mentioned stigma quite a lot, and I think, Valerie, you talked about it being kind of multifaceted and multi layered. But I wondered actually how we step forward a bit further in terms of truly addressing that. So, um, you know, there's organisational levels, but also individual level ways of thinking about it. And I just, uh, it's one of the our current debates about the best way to address it. And I just wondered what your thinking currently was on that. Oh, and we'd love to help you look, talk to people who um, have had a late diagnosis. <laughs> I can start if you like, Martin. Um, thank you, Kerry. And, and we'll take you up on that. We'll be in touch. <laughs> um, Yes, I think stigma, it's been a very, very hard thing. One, it's very hard to measure and therefore monitor when you're doing uh, anything at all. And then secondly, because of these many, many levels and, and uh, it's just been one of those things, too, too hard basket and we do need to address it. I think that the, the quick wins are within the healthcare system um, because that's where people should be comfortable about disclosing their HIV. And we know there are, um, uh, well, we know, but we're, we're not, Still, we're, and, and others can come in here because this is part of, you know, um, my learning around um, whether there's been some really effective strategies locally um, in one getting healthcare workers really up to speed with with um, HIV. And I guess some people say, oh, okay, should it just be one of those um, mandatory trainings? Um, I think we need a bit more than that. We need greater sensitivities, and it touches on all sorts of issues around um, how we how we care for people, not just living with HIV, but all sorts of uh, discriminatory uh, um, uh, ways that perhaps we're not even aware within the healthcare setting, um, how we approach that. And of course, I'm thinking here of, of people um, of uh, gender diversity, uh, with uh, diverse genders who feel often that um, they are maybe discriminated against because people are unaware of, of, of how to, to talk to people about their gender. So there, there's, I think there's some real, um, quicker wins within the healthcare setting. Um, but have I heard of really effective programs? N no, I'd love to hear more from other people. Um, the other side is, is within communities. And certainly that that is, is major. And we, we talked about religion and, and within uh, religious settings, for instance, and certainly where there are key figures, key stakeholders, key uh, champions within a community who are open to talk about it. Um, HIV, that, that helps a lot. Um, and I'd be really interested to, to hear about what, what's happening in Uganda for that. They, they actually have had some really successful programs in, in that uh, area that I know of. So they're two of the things, just so I just let others um, talk as well. I think that teed you up nicely, but, uh, Elizabeth. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, indeed, um, the subject of stigma and discrimination 
uh, is something we've been fighting over the years. And as a country, of course, we were among the first <clears throat> countries to, co to come out strong about HIV. And this kind of uh, uh, tackled a lot of stigma, stigma, though we still have it in different layers. So a number of uh, strategies are being implemented. Um, I'll give an example from uh, my practice where we are uh, under the Section Reproductive Health um, Umbrella uh, Program uh, that is uh, sponsored by the Swedish Embassy managed by Frontline AIDS. Uh, we've been employing a number of strategies to deal with stigma. First, with uh, when it comes to uh, the health workers, sensitization uh, as to how to offer friendly services. Because um, in most cases, the person that you treat today uh, has a new diagnosis today, will will be able to either disclose and bring more, or will just feel like uh, already they are feeling stigma from the care they've received. So we've been um, reaching out to health workers, uh, uh, doing our best to um, empower them on how they can um, counsel uh, the clients and empower them on how they can disclose. Then we've also been involved in a number of community activities um, where we are conducting a number of community dialogues. And, uh, and through these dialogues, we're able to reach the communities and, uh, and, and, and change their mindset about HIV so that um, tomorrow when someone is diagnosed, they don't face the stigma within the community that they come from. Then we're also having a number of um, peer to peer support um, strategies still to, to tackle the element of, of, um, of stigma. Then uh, we are engaging champions, as Valerie mentioned, especially the cultural leaders, the religious leaders are uh, using a lot of avenues involving uh, mass media, uh, distributing information, education, communication materials, just to make sure that information infiltrates everywhere and uh, and uh, people get to know that they when they get a, a, an HIV a positive HIV diagnosis, it doesn't mean it's the end of life, and more so, it is not plastered at their forehead that look, I have HIV. Because many think that when I go to get diagnosed, when I get diagnosed, I'll be walking and it will be on my forehead. Look, I have HIV. So that is um, uh, part of what we are doing, and in uh, in making sure that we reach all the communities and uh, and deal with stigma as we re as we promote testing. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, we've got Emma Cole who wants to come in on uh, the issue of stigma. S uh, sorry, Steve. I'm going to just bring Emma in just for, uh, because we're talking about stigma. Thank you. Uh, just just quickly, um, I'm I've been living with HIV for thirty years now, and I very much fit into the category of someone who would never have been considered at risk. And had my partner not told me back in nineteen ninety one when the condom failed, it would have taken well over a decade until I got sick with suspected PCP. And even then, I doubt whether an HIV test would have been offered because I didn't fit the risk profile. And I still find if we're looking at certain sort of at-risk groups, we miss, if you like, the general population, people like me. And one thought I had is if a COVID vaccine is going to become a sort of annual event, could that be an opportunity to at least raise um, a su suggestion of an HIV test at the same time? Because then you'll be capturing people who, like you say, wouldn't necessarily go to a sexual health clinic, or people who, like myself, would never have considered themselves at risk. And, you know, fortunately, I've survived 30 years and I haven't let the stigma affect my life. I've carried on working, etc. But I do know I'm in a very priv privileged position to be out there and very public and not um, fear for my safety or anything like that as a positive woman. Thank you, Emma. Um, does any of the panellists want to come in on this or shall I ask Steve uh, to come up with his question? Anyone? I, yeah, I, I can just do a very brief answer, which I think is a great idea, uh, Emma, and um, there is some work that we're doing with various other um, people in other parts of health service around sort of reminders to GPs to test in certain situations and a, an annual vaccine would be a good opportunity to include in various other routine things that people do with their GPs. <clears throat> Thank you, David. Um, Steve, do you want to ask your question? Thank you. As some people in the call will know, um, the Elton John AIDS Foundation has been running the Zero HIV Social Impact Bond in Lambeth, Southwark and Lewisham um, 
for just over two years now. And our partners in hospitals, primary care and community organisations have between them found over 300 people who were either unaware of their HIV diagnosis or who for some reason had uh, fallen out of care. And we've linked them back into care. And this has been done on the basis of outcome-based payment contracts. And uh, I was mindful of what Michael said in his introduction about outcome-based incentives. And I'd be interested in the panel's view about how might we find the optimum balance between including these activities that can help us find people who are unaware of their diagnosis and to have those in contracts versus having outcome-based payments that can incentivize providers to do a little bit extra in order to find people who are either unaware of their HIV status or perhaps for linking people back into care. What do you think is the right balance and how might we find that? Michael, do you want to kick off on this one? Okay, sure. I, I'm not sure I, I, I know what the right balance is, but I think both of those approaches and probably a mixed approach has to be the way forward. I think, you know, we've been spending decades having these discussions and there are lots of models of things that work, but we've failed to move from a system of lots of really excellent pilots into a system of equity of provision and everywhere having as great outcomes as some areas do in these in these pilots and however you look at it there is some degree of financial and or contractual um carrot to those to those programs and i think we need to start therefore having some you know robust discussions about the cost of this i mean i think i think it, it, for many reasons we need to recognize that it's expensive to tackle stigma in, in, in all of its complexity, it's expensive to understand it. It's expensive and probably will get increasingly expensive for a short period of time to find those increasingly smaller numbers of more diverse and heterogeneous populations who are not testing, living with undiagnosed uh, HIV or, or getting late diagnosis. So I think we need to start having those those discussions about yeah, what will it cost and what are the best levers, contractual and or financial, to 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 do to uh, deliver it, and I think the same thing goes for a lot of those engagement things that the, the, the stigma busting things. We've got a lot to learn from um, the work that Elizabeth's been describing because those principles are equally transferable over here. But that kind of work to do it in a systematic way that turns up new diagnoses or reduce late diagnosis is going to be costly, uh, and I think we need to start having those those discussions because I think we've got plenty of data now to support what, how to do it. We just need to uh, use the levers to, 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 to commission it properly, I think. Elizabeth, do you want to come in on this? Yes, uh, thank you very much. I do agree with um, Steve uh, and uh, with Michael. Indeed, um, of course, as uh, Alive, we were also one of the implementers of the Deep Engagement Grant um, funded by uh, the Elton John AIDS Foundation. And uh, this really gave us a good um, uh, uh, start off in reaching the, the marginalized, especially the LGBTI population. And indeed, it was at an extra cost because uh, um, you have to move from the health facility to really find them where they are. And uh, not just that, it has other, in, other costs in, um, uh, implicated. So when we um, think of strategies uh, that we can implement, definitely they do have additional costs for us to be successful. So indeed, it's it, it, it's both ways. Thank you very much. David, I see you have a hand up. Yeah, sure. The, I think just to um, answer the, you know, what sort of incentives are possible, I, I, um, I thought about it a little bit in terms of both the primary and secondary care, and it's quite complicated in secondary care how you create those incentives. But in primary care, having talked to quite a few GPs over the years, um, what they basically say is the only way to get anything done in GP practice is to provide an incentive. And historically, those have been either quote, cost or quality outcome framework things or enhanced services 
And I think it's really worth having a go. And as Val said earlier, you know, this is the, what implements the implementation science can help us with by saying, let's try it in an area, let's you know see if it works. And if it does work, put it out further, further on. So I'd be very much in favor of those um, those type of models. <clears throat> Uh, thank you, Dave. Uh, we've got one quick question from Jill, uh, Jim Fielder. Jim, do you want to ask a question? Sure. Thanks, Mark. Um, yeah, it was just a question around um, transmittable viral load. And what, what do we understand by people who are being diagnosed late, but still, um, you know, remaining with a transmittable viral load? Because I think, you know, we talked about how we can try and capture um, and you know, di you know, get to people who are perhaps you know harder to reach, as as we say. Um, but actually, once they've been diagnosed, I think some of the data is showing that it is you know harder to keep them retained in care, or harder to keep them, um, or get them to a, a an undetectable viral load. And I just wondered what the panelists' understanding is around um, around people who are being diagnosed late and how we can ensure that they um, you know retain re remain in care and um, get to an um, uh, you know an undetectable viral load which may not be possible in in all cases for you know clinical reasons but just um, just be interested to know what what the panelists views are around that uh, Valerie? I can come in initially if you like um, thanks for that question I, I, actually you, whether you're diagnosed late or not in the UK you do you know, we do very well to get most people on treatment fairly quickly. Um, so 90% of people by the end of the year, whether or not they're diagnosed late, will, will be on treatment. Um, that doesn't mean it hasn't been as effective and, and viral load may not quite uh, be undetectable for some. But essentially, I think in terms of the U equals U message, um, I think being diagnosed late or not, once you're actually diagnosed and in the system, you do extremely well to, to, to become un undetectable. Um, obviously, if you're ill in hospital, you know, it's, it's not um, the issue. It's more about your personal health that you're more concerned about at that point. Um, I don't know. I'm not sure if that, that's what your question was about. But, you know, there, there is, um, as Michael said in his introduction, there's been a huge shift to now getting people very quickly on treatment when they're ready. Now, some of those diagnosed late, um, I could look at that data. We haven't split it specifically. I'm going, you know, that's something we could do with the, with the HARS data we have, which is are they more likely to delay a little bit compared to others? Um, but it would be just by a few weeks on an average. That doesn't mean that um, uh, you know there, there's obviously more of a shock factor around being diagnosed potentially when you're diagnosed late because you know you haven't been really you haven't felt at risk and you may not not sort of you know it all comes to you so it might mean a few visits um, before you're you're ready to come on treatment but this is where I think the clinics are doing a, an excellent job of trying to um, make people aware of the benefits of, of their treatment for their own well-being. Um, and, and certainly people are coming back to, to the clinic and we're, we're seeing the uptake within three months um, of diagnosis being extremely high in the UK. Thank you, Valerie. I'm very conscious that we've yes. only got a minute left. Um, if anyone uh, of the panelists want uh, to uh, answer that with a very a short answer, uh, that uh, would be much appreciated. Yes. Um, thank you very much, uh, uh, Jim, for the question. So, of course, one, uh, the current treatment is very effective. I'll give an example. In um, Uganda, our first line is, um, uh, involves one of Rwanda drugs, uh, Doltegravir, and this has been shown to really um, bring suppression in, in within about uh, six to eight weeks. But one of the great deterrents to um, receiving um, a, a suppressed viral load is actually poor adherence amongst uh, the late presenters. And this usually is due to one, remember they've come in with um, other opportunistic infections. So you find that uh, they have a higher pill burden. 
So on top of uh, starting on ARVs, they also have uh, uh, to receive treatment for other opportunistic infections. And remember also their quality of life is not so good. So you'll find that um, the key driver here is uh, poor ad adherence. And on top of that, we tend to have more frequent visits. And, uh, and in, in our setting, some people find the key challenge is actually transport to the health facility. But um, of late, uh, we've been in a number of discussions and we noticed one of the strategies is to, uh, for once the person has been on medication for at least three months, we give them a longer refill instead of a monthly visit to at least a three month visit and then follow up virtually so that uh, we, we are, they have their medication, but we're also following up to make sure that they're adhering to the medication. So once again, the poor quality of life, opportunistic infections that cause them to, to be on a, a number of pills at the same time as the ARVs will lead to poor adherence. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, I'm very conscious that we've, we have actually gone over time. Uh, I just want to say thank you to uh, David, Michael, Elizabeth and Valerie for being on the panel and, and being uh, to actually taking us through what does late diagnosis actually mean for the individual, the health service, and also it's all about testing and it's also about beat, uh, fighting the stigma. And I think we can, uh, we can actually learn from each other from not only from England, but from Wales, Scotland and other parts of the world in actually addressing this. Uh, thank you for uh, everyone attending. We have got another event coming up in May on the quality of life. We'll be advertising that soon. Um, but thank you for coming. Thank you for an informative um, event.